get started this morning with a word of prayer, and um, as you find your way to your seat, if you have your bulletin this morning, I'll give you a couple announcements, some things you can jot down for prayer as we get ready to begin, but uh, if you notice on the inside, there is a whole slew of dates there that are coming up, uh, and we know that as we get into the summer months, uh, that scheduling and coordinating things can be a little difficult, so not all the details are there, but there are some dates there for the next a uh, few months that may help you uh, plan accordingly. And then a few that are coming up this week. Uh, you see a seniors activity at the Young's house coming up this week. Next week we'll have Nathaniel Inslee here with us. And he'll be sharing what God is doing there in their church plant in uh, Burns, Wyoming. And then headed to a new church plant. He'll be preaching for us as well. And then a spring work day coming up in a couple weeks. And we did one of these last year. And come together for a few hours, work on a few projects here and some over at the Mission House as we'll be wrapping up some things there and uh, then we'll finish with lunch. But those are coming up in the next few weeks and we're excited about each of those. Uh, as we do open in prayer, we have a few of our members, a few people from our church we want to uh, keep in mind as we do open in prayer this morning. Uh, if you would pray, pray for uh, Glenn Gooding and Gail Sharon and Karen Dorsey all having some procedures done this week and so if you would uh, pray for each of them, and you've been praying for Gail and for Earl both. Uh, they're at home, and Earl, as some of his dementia has progressed, Gail's been caring for him, and so uh, this week will be difficult. We're going to do what we can to help them. And uh, then thankful, I was gone last week, and thank you for your prayers. It's good to have uh, the Mavlingers back with us. Continue to pray for Brother Alex and the passing of his dad, and then praying for uh, Margaret Tigner as well at home uh, this morning, and uh, for the Tigner family, and they texted me this morning and said they're watching, and so we send them our love and our prayers, and uh, we love both of them, and we want to think about them this morning as we do open today, and then we'll go to the Lord, have some uh, special uh, things today, uh, have a baptism a little later, and a uh, testimony that we're going to hear from this morning, I'm excited about it, and ask the Lord to teach us from his word today as well. Father, thank you for um, your goodness to us, and uh, you are good and righteous and holy, but you are merciful and loving and faithful. And uh, we praise you that though we don't understand how all of those things could even possibly uh, go together and how you can be patient with us, uh, that you are. And so we praise you for that. Uh, we ask that you bless in the midst of our church this morning a number of people that are uh, having procedures this week and uh, difficulties, and we just ask that you bless and lift the, each of them up and uh, help us to love and support them as church family, physically, but also spiritually. And we know that uh, when someone's not feeling well or going through pain, struggles, um, even emotionally uh, struggling, that there can time can just seem long and uh, things can uh, drag on. And so we pray that uh, as a church body, we'd encourage each other, lift each other up in you and in your name. We praise you that we can come together this morning uh, with the freedom to sing and to lift up your name in song and to, uh, to pray publicly before you and to open your word and to expound it, to preach from it, to hear from it. And so we pray that uh, you would help us this morning, encourage us, fill us with your spirit, make that evident to us. Uh, we have Ryan in a few minutes and the testimony that he'll give and thankful that God's working in his heart and then praying for continued work and each of our lives and in the hearts of others from our church. And uh, we do pray that you would uh, give us a, uh, um, we'll say it this way, a good time this morning uh, surrounding your word with your family. And uh, we'll praise you for. As you're seated this morning, going to uh, do something a little different at this point in the service. I'm excited about it this morning. And uh, you know, sometimes we'll open our passage of scripture and we'll read and we'll do that in a few minutes. In fact, I want to speak to some of what we just sang. It says, his work is finished. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about this morning from John chapter 19, really just one verse today. And um, we'll see how that goes. But just one verse, John chapter 19, verse 30 in just a minute. Uh, but a few, let's start at the beginning. No, I'm just kidding. A few uh, a few weeks ago, Ryan Kelly and I had the chance to talk a little bit about what God is doing in his life. Actually, several times over the last uh, few months, we've had a chance to talk a little bit about what God is doing in his life. 
And uh, Ryan doesn't know this part of it, but uh, of course we've been praying for him. But I've just been praying a little bit about um, some things to do, whether it's in our morning service or in the evenings or in our classes, that kind of thing. And I think as we gather together and worship the Lord, uh, uh, that there's a lot of different components to that. There is singing, there's preaching, teaching, uh, and that there's praying. But I think as you look at the early New Testament church and you see the example set there, uh, there's often testimony of what God has done in someone's life. Paul spoke very often about what God was doing in people's lives, in these different churches that had been planted and established. And I think that it's encouraging to hear uh, what God is doing in somebody's life. Uh, Ryan's coming today for baptism in just a little while, and uh, he's going to be baptized at the end of our service, and I'll let him tell you a little bit what has brought him to that decision. But in talking a little bit, what we have discussed, and we say this quite often here, is that baptism is an outward sign or show, display, of what God is doing inside, of what God is doing inside your heart. And uh, Ryan has grown up here in our church, and uh, been around from a long time, from the time he was a little kid to now as a young man and as an adult. And um, sometimes that can be more nerve-wracking to get up here and stand. I know on that part, because I was a little kid that ran around here as well. So we have a, a lot in common in those ways. Uh, but God's been working in Ryan's heart, and I'm excited about it. I've been praying uh, that God would kind of show me how to incorporate some of the uh, testimonies of people in our church. And if you're willing to share testimony, you would let me know that as well. It doesn't mean that everybody that comes for baptism needs to give a testimony, or everybody that gives a testimony needs to come for baptism. But I thought it fit well together this morning, and Ryan came to me and said, you know, the Lord's been working in my heart. If there's a service or there's a time or somewhere um, that I can give my testimony, I'd love to do it. I said, oh, conveniently, I have been thinking about this. And so I've asked him this morning to come share a little bit about what God's doing in his heart and what's led him to this moment of baptism to show outwardly that he is deciding in his heart to follow Christ. So, Ryan, you come on. I've given him 55 minutes to speak. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he's just a few minutes to speak, and he's going to come share with us in his heart. He's a little nervous, so smile at him this morning as he comes. Ryan, come ahead. All right, so you said I have 55 minutes. All right, um... So I really think, you know, the best place to begin my testimony is really pretty much going to go off of what I told James a couple of weeks ago. You know, from the best of my knowledge, I was saved February 23rd, 2006, uh, at the age of six years old. So <laughs> if I'm being honest, I don't really remember anything about that day. My parents may, but, you know, I think the only thing I really remember is, you know, the first thing is sitting down with my parents, you know, in my room. And second thing I remember is running out of my room a couple of minutes later to tell my sister I'd gotten saved. Other than that, I don't remember anything. I don't even know what I said um, in my prayer, I, literally nothing. Um, so in the normal course of events, you know, I decided that I wanted to be baptized. So um, me and my parents sat down with his granddad at the time, and, you know, I said, um, you know, I think I need to be baptized. And he said, okay, well, you know, why is it that you need to be baptized? And at that time, I really... From what I was told, because I don't really remember too much about it, you know, I was six years old, of course. <laughs> so from what I what, I'm, what I was told, I didn't really understand the nature of baptism. I didn't really understand why I needed to be baptized. I thought, really, at the time, it was like this, you know, baptism is, is like one of these things that like seals your salvation, you know, like that's you know, kind of like the the final touch on it. And because I didn't understand it at the time, we said, you know, <clears throat> when you we're going to hold off for now, but when you understand, then you can come back and talk to us, and you'll get baptized. So, you know, I wish I could stand up here and say, you know what, like, a couple of years later, when I finally understood, you know, I got baptized. But I'm standing up here, and it's been, it's been 16 years, you know, um, kind of emotional, in, kind of emotional in a way, because when I think about, you know, you know, what's, what's taken 16 years for me to get up here? It's not because I didn't understand, you know, why I needed to be baptized. I think it really comes down to two things. And if I'm being, I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. This might be one of the most, like, raw, like, and unfiltered, you know, um, testimonies that you've heard. But I think the first thing that it really comes down to is, number one, pride. You know, I understood from a very young age, you know, 
obviously not when I was six years old, but several years after that, I understood why I needed to be baptized. It wasn't something that I just realized a couple weeks ago. And so I had this, it's kind of funny when you think about it, but I had this kind of recurring thought, you know, as I got older and I got into junior high, high school, and eventually like college, you know, I'm out of college now, but I had this recurring thought. I'm like, you know what, if I get up and I decided to be baptized, you know, after all these years of, you know, I don't know how, how many years it was, but after all these years of, you know, being saved, what are people going to think of me? You know, like, was he really saved all that time? Like, and my whole thought was, all right, look, I don't want people thinking I just now got saved. Like, I was saved for, like, quite a few years, right? Like, I've been saved since I was six years old. Like, let's get one thing straight. That's pride. Um, there's nothing noble and there's nothing noble in that. And so I think at the time, and I think really throughout, you know, the last 16 years, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to because it was, you know, I think I became too comfortable. I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm a Christian, you know, I go to church, I tithe, you know, I consider myself a good person, you know, like, I don't curse, I don't do this, I don't do that, like, at the end of the day, if Jesus were to come back, you know, I'm going to heaven, you know, that's all that matters, you know, and, which, that's not the only thing that matters, but that was kind of my whole thought process, so I was like, you know what, just forget it, I'm not going to do it, and it's funny because, it's not really funny, but I had actually made the decision not to get baptized, which, not sure that I've ever heard anybody, you know, say that before, but I had actually made the decision I wasn't going to get baptized. Second thing was, you know, over the course of 16 years, if I had to describe, you know, my spiritual life with just one word, I would say lukewarm and really oftentimes cold. Um, you know, I think, you know, it's really hard to take that next step and to really, you know, follow God to decide to get baptized when you're not really living for God, when you're not like, and having the right relationship with him. You don't have a right relationship with him. Why would you ever take that next step and get baptized? And so for me, it was because I was, you know, I was lukewarm. I think, you know, I had made several, there were several points in my life where, you know, I, you know, decided to follow God. You know, I was like, you know what, I'm gonna follow God. But then I would slip back into my old patterns of living, being a comfortable Christian. And so I'll give, a, I'll give a quick example of, you know, probably one of the biggest ways that I've just been lukewarm is the fact that I think for me, and I think I speak for all of us when I say that as a Christian, it's really easy to be a Christian when the circumstances are favorable. I think, you know, for me, I was a convenient Christian, you know, when I'm inside of church, oh yeah, I can be a Christian, easy. You know, when I'm in the midst of Christian friends, oh yeah, easy. Like, you ask me, you know, like, if I'm saved, oh, yeah, of course. Am I living for God? Oh, of course. <laughs> well, but then when it comes to getting out into the world, and I say world, but I really mean, like, you walk outside of these doors, I mean, literally anywhere, it's a different story. It, it's really, you know, it's really what, the, really what it means to be bold in your faith. And so, you know, having lived all over the place, you know, over the last, you know, couple of years, I've had a lot of people ask me, you know, because we've gotten in conversations about stuff, and, like, they'll obviously bring up something, you know, that, you know, as Christians, you know, like, we believe that is wrong, you know, stuff like that, and so they would ask me, you know, like, why I don't do certain things, and so, you know, in my desire to be approved by others, my desire to be, you know, pleasing to others and to get other people to like me, I would say, oh, you know, it's just, it's because it's a standard of mine, you know, I don't, I just don't do those things, so, like, okay, you know, I get that, I get that. They're like, well, why is it a standard of yours? And I say, well, you know, it's just, it's, it's something that I've decided I'm not gonna do, which both of those things are true, but is that the real reason, you know? Um, and it's not, because what, ended, what I ended up doing was I was really just hiding the fact that I was a Christian, and I don't really understand why we do that sometimes. It's like, why would we hide the, best part of our lives? Why would we hide the most important thing that separates us from the world? And so what ended up happening was I began to really just blend in with the very people that we as Christians are called to reach. And I'm not proud to even say that. I mean, <laughs> but those were the two reasons that came to mind was pride and living a lukewarm Christian life. And that's why for 16 years I've haven't made the decision to come and get baptized. Obviously, it's a big step for me because, you know, after 16 years, you know, it's kind of like, all right, so like, you know, it's been 16 years. Like, what have you been doing for that time? <laughs> but I think 
it's really just a testament to really one thing, one thing only, and that's that God's done something in my life. And you know, I, I can't give myself any credit for being up here today. Like I told you guys, like I made a decision years ago. I was like, you know, I'm not going to get baptized. I'm not going to get baptized. <laughs> I think God has a funny sense of irony. And, um, you know, here I am, and I'm, I'm getting baptized today. But thank you. So I want to talk about a little bit about kind of how I got here as far as baptism, you know, like I talked about the last 16 years, why I didn't get baptized. So um, many of you guys know I've been living all over the place. You know, every time you talk to me, I'm like, hey, I'm living here, I'm living here. You know, I'm just kind of like moving all over the place. But I think really um, the end of last year, many of you guys remember, um, and I don't mean to, you know, make a, anybody who's listening feel, feel a little bit uncomfortable, but uh, I came back for um, one of my good friends, Wyatt Durrett, his mom had passed away back in September. Many of you guys remember that his mom passed away last year and um, came back for a funeral. Emotional time, of course, but um, I think, you know, God really began to get a hold of my heart at that time. And I promised, I, I, I promised myself this morning I wasn't going to get emotional, but uh, he really began to get a hold of my heart and um, I began to go through things that. I didn't really expect I was going to go through, and I stayed here a little bit longer than usual, and, you know, there's just some things that I was going through in my life, and then um, just, I think there came a point, you know, at the end of last year, it was just emotionally, physically, spiritually, you know, I just kind of felt at, just kind of felt at rock bottom, I just, I felt like I was, <laughs> felt like I couldn't get any lower in my life, and I began to question a lot of things, but most importantly, my salvation, so, you know, like I said at the beginning, I thought I was saved at you know, six years old, back in my room in my parents' house, and um, so I began to question my salvation, and um, you know, I began to ask myself, you know, questions that I really couldn't answer, you know, so for example, you know, I really couldn't remember the day I was saved, you know, I, I told you I remember two things, you know, sitting in my parents' room, and then um, also running out a couple minutes later. I don't remember anything about what I said, and so I began to tie my assurance and salvation in the fact of how well I could remember the day of my salvation. So I was sitting there and I was thinking, there would be days where I would, literally, I'd be sitting in church and, you know, he's talking about salvation or something, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, I can't remember the day that I was saved. And I'm like, if I can't remember the day, of, the day that I was saved, like, am I really saved? And then, um, you know, I'd ask myself questions like, you know, at the time, was I, was I really committed to God? Was I really committed to God or was, you know, was it just something that I said? And then here's, here's the question that really got me the most, you know, was I sorry enough? Um, that's a question you can't answer. Even your best repentance is still not even close to what God deserves. And, um, you know, my dad actually kind of explained it in a, in a pretty simple way. He's, he said, you know, there's, Ryan, there's really no scale at which you can measure how sorry you are. It's not like this is where you are in terms of sorry. This is where you need to be in order to be saved. And, you know, that's not how it works. It's are you truly sorry or are you truly not, you know? And um, uh, that was, um, I forgot what I was going to say for a second. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, so I, I, I just really doubted my salvation. I began to ask myself questions I really couldn't answer. So um, there just came a point in my life where I just, it, the burden just became so heavy. Um, Remember, I was sitting up there, James was preaching, and <clears throat> wasn't listening to your sermon, of course, because I was struggling, but inside, you know, I just, you know, it, it, it was just a breaking point for me. I just couldn't hold it in any longer. It was like, I, this is something I got to, like, figure out. Like, I got I to gotta get this straight, or otherwise, like, I don't really know what I'm going to do. So I put out my phone, and I wouldn't really advise this because it's not really, like, what you should be doing, like, when you have questions. So I put out my phone, and uh, went on the Internet, and I searched, you know, how to know for sure you were saved. Like, come on, let's be real. All of us have done something like that at some point in our lives. And um, one of the first suggestions that popped up was a book. It caught my eye because it was like this yellow book and it had like big black letters on it. And it said, uh, the title of the book was Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart. I said, that's interesting. I was like, I've never really heard a book, you know, like called that. And so kind of like intrigued by the title, I opened up my, uh, clicked on it. And several minutes later, I ordered it in the middle of church. <laughs> so um, long story short, you know, ever since I read that book, you know, my life has never been the same. But I, I, wa I want to point out one thing. The book didn't change my life. God did. But I'd like to think had I never picked up that book, I wouldn't be here today because that book really, I mean, it's, 
it explained and it gave me answers to things that I've been, I wasn't, questions that I had had for so long and questions that, you know, we can, it's easy to say, okay, you know, turn to the scriptures, you know, but I think sometimes the scriptures can kind of be a little bit confusing in and of itself. And sometimes you need that ex explanation of, you know, passages and whatnot. And so, you know, and then up to a couple weeks ago, you know, I, I went and talked to James about it. You know, after reading that book, I was like, you know what? Um, and I got my spiritual life set, you know, I, I think if you asked me today, you know, and not I think, but I know, if you were to ask me today, like, am I saved? Like, absolutely, like, absolutely. There's no question about that. And I stand before you today, I can say that with 100% confidence because my assurance is no longer tied up in the fact of how well I remember the day of salvation. It's not tied up in, like, did I say the right thing in prayer? Like, did I really, did I use those specific words, like, Jesus, will you come into my heart? Like, it's not, it's no longer tied up in those things. It's tied up in the fact that my, my faith, my uh, salvation is found in the finished work of Christ. It's, it doesn't have anything to do with me. Like, I could, I mean, there are days I, I don't feel saved, but nowhere in the Bible does it talk about, you know, like, feelings and salvation, you know? Um, but yeah, I, with 100% certainty, I'm, I'm saved, and the reason why I know I'm saved, um, and I think this is crucial, is because of the promise of God's word. You know, salvation is as simple as belief and repentance. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not more complicated than that. I think we like to overcomplicate things. We're like, you know what? Like, salvation really can't be as simple as belief and repentance. But when you think about it, God, if God desires for every person to come to repentance, if God desires for every one of us to get to know him, then why would he make salvation complicated, right? So, um, and I would say it's because, uh, the, I mean, belief is as simple as do you believe, <laughs> it's, a, it's a yes or no question. Do you believe? And repentance is as simple as, number one, are you sorry for your sin? Like, are you, it's not sorry enough. It's, are you sorry for your sin? Are you truly sorry or not? If so, will you ask God to forgive you of your sins? And that's, that's, that's really what it comes down to. And so, that's, I mean, the promise of God's word. I mean, God tells us that, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. I mean, how much clearer can we get, right? And so I'm coming up here, um, sharing my testimony with you guys. I'm ultimately going to get baptized here in, I don't know how long, but I'm going to get baptized at the end of the service today. And um, I'm, I'm excited. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that God pulled me back. <laughs> I'm grateful. I'm grateful because... Lord only knows where I would have ended up had it not been for him. So not going to get emotional, but um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my testimony. And I appreciate each and every one of you guys listening. And hope today was an encouragement. You know, I just wanted to share, you know, my life, you know, you know, simply what God has been doing. And God changed my life. I mean, that's. He may not get emotional, but I will. <laughs> uh, we had the privilege to work with Ryan some as a teenager. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change things up on, us, on everybody a little bit today. I know what Philip's going to sing in a few minutes. And Philip, I'm going to ask you to sing it for invitation, if you would. So instrumentalist, you can go down. If you have your Bible, you can look at John 19. And uh, I already know what Philip's going to be singing in a few minutes. And it, it will tie well with what we're going to look at. And ultimately, it will tie well with what Ryan just mentioned. So I'm going to change that just a little. I want you to hear it and really listen to the words in just a few minutes. John chapter 19, and uh, we had a chance to work with Ryan some as a teenager in a variety of uh, capacities, and um, man, for um, a long time, he would probably never, as a teenager, have wanted to think that he was like me, but for a long time, I remember looking at Ryan thinking, man, he is just like me, um, and, and how I grew up, and uh, kind of what some of the things I went through, and I told him, and um, I only do this because I know he's okay with it, and um, I don't reveal, I've had several different counseling meetings, 10 or 12 counseling meetings in the last um, uh, few weeks, and I don't share all of those, but I'll share a couple of things that Ryan mentioned that stood out to me, 
uh, when we were talking about these things. But I told Ryan, I said, Ryan, I remember, there, I remember a time in high school where it was like there was a switch. And I said, we had this connection. I'd go talk to him. He'd be open. Um, before team ministry groups or different things or on activity or something, he, he'd be very open, that kind of thing. And there, there was this day where all of a sudden that just sort of went away. And uh, we didn't have that connection anymore for one reason or another. And um, not just myself, but many people have been praying for Ryan for uh, a long time. And um, it's a, a fruit of a church that uh, has been patient with the Lord's work in somebody's life, that has been loving uh, continually anytime they've had the opportunity. Ryan hasn't been here the entire time for four or five years. He's been in and out. Uh, but when he has, you've embraced him and taken him in and loved him. And um, when Ryan came, he said, he, he explained much of what he just told you. And he said, I said, you know, Ryan, that sounds great. I'm excited that the Lord's worked in your life. We started talking about a few other things. He said, oh, I'm glad you feel that way. I was afraid when I came, you would say, no, 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 you need to, right now, you need to have a different thing. You need to have a time that you remember every word that you pray. You need to have something that locks it away. I said, Ryan, I, I can't counsel you to do that because I don't have that. Uh, I said, I was a 12-year-old kid that saw some of my friends give testimony about what God was doing in their life. And I said, man, I don't, I don't know that God's doing those things in my life. And I remember going home. We played outside, did stuff after church. We lived right back here. And I remember going home, and uh, we were dirty. It was one of those times parents say, don't get dirty, and then you do. And uh, so I went home and took a shower. I remember being in the shower thinking, man, if God's not working in me like he's working in them, maybe I'm not saved. I remember thinking, man, if I die right now, maybe I'll go to hell. And so I prayed in the shower, just right there, just said, okay, Lord, save me. And, um, but the truth is, for the next several years after that, I had no interest in the things of the Lord, no interest in God, turned from Him, um, hid a lot of it very well. And um, I, I, I told Ryan, I said, you know, I don't know if that was the exact moment of my conversion or not, or if it was later. But I came to a point in my life where I was 16 or 17, and God did start working in my life. And I came to a place where I realized, I am a Christian. I do believe. I am repentant. And God has worked in my heart now. And in the same way that Ryan says, I couldn't remember the exact moment of my prayer and how it felt and what the circumstances were, so it caused me to doubt. Don't let the reverse be true either, in that you do remember a prayer and you do remember a circumstance, and so you're tying your salvation to that, because that's not what it's about. And uh, the counsel or the thought that we gave to him is, what about right now? Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Are you repentant of your sin? How would God describe the state of your heart right now? Um, and and we, seeking there for assurance. And he mentioned a minute ago, he said that some days I don't feel like I'm saved. And he asked me, he said, do you ever feel unsaved or not saved is how we would phrase it. I said, yeah, I think there are moments that we probably all feel like that. And you know, that Ryan's a very healthy, fit young man. I kind of gave him the example. And I said, Ryan, he said, you could you eat healthy. He does meal planning. He does all this different stuff. He goes, he exercises. He said, you've done that for all these years. I said, for the next five days, you eat pizza and burgers for every meal. At the end of that five days, are you going to feel like a healthy eater? You're not. <laughs> you are. You've been doing it for quite some time. But all of a sudden, when you stop, that feeling's not going to be there. And in the same way, Sometimes we question and we doubt our salvation. He said, it struck me, he said, I had pride and I had apathy. I had pride and I was lukewarm. I had pride and I was apathy, and it and led him to doubt. And man, isn't that true in our lives, in everyone's life? I think something that we don't speak about quite often enough as we should, but the doubt that he experienced and that feeling of being unsaved. If I'm a Christian, which means I have a real active relationship with my God, I've been redeemed, I've been justified, I'm in his word, I'm praying, and I'm living for him each day. When I stop doing those things, then I don't feel saved. If I eat pizza every day, I don't feel like a healthy eater. And the same thing is true in our lives. There are things that make us feel unsaved, but I'm glad that the Lord has worked in Ryan's heart and, and moved him to trust in what he said. It's going to lead right into this message, into the finished work of Jesus Christ in his life. It doesn't mean that Jesus is done with Ryan, but it means that Jesus has completely saved Ryan, and Ryan doesn't have to worry of that anymore. So I want you to look at John chapter 19 very quickly for a few minutes. We'll read a few verses and just focus on one this morning. You know, there's a lot of final words that are 
impactful and meaningful. And uh, we've been studying the book of Daniel recently, and we're going to continue to do that on Wednesday nights. We are into the, Daniel's final vision. We started it this past Wednesday night. We're going to be there for two more Wednesday nights. And so we're going to get into a new book of study on Sunday morning after Easter. But for a couple of weeks, we're going to look at this circumstance surrounding Jesus on the cross and his resurrection and point out just one Really, really one word, not even just one verse this morning, one word that we're going to look to. And I think it's going to, I think what the Lo- Lord is doing in Ryan's heart, I think he'll speak to us from this word as well. John chapter 19, look down if you would in verse um, number one. It says, then Pilate therefore took Jesus. So Jesus is already being tried. He's already been betrayed by Judas. He's been given over to the Jewish leaders, and then ultimately the Roman rulers. Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, whipped him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. So, by Jewish law, they're accusing Jesus of blasphemy. He says he's God, and that is worthy of punishment. But the Jews are under Roman control. They can't punish him legally. And it's getting close to the Sabbath. And so they go to the Roman rulers, and Pilate says, I can't find anything that he's done that is worth punishment, let alone death. But to appease them, he whips the Lord Jesus, though he's innocent. And he says, now I'll give him back to you whipped, but I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. So seeing Jesus mocked as a king emboldens them, saying, He's not a king, he's not God. Pilate saith to them, unto them, Taking him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, saying, Answered him, We have a law, and by our law, He ought to die because he made himself the son of God. And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me, knowing, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? And Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from henceforth, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. So they're turning this. They're saying, well, he says he's a king. And so the Roman emperor will have something to say about this. And when Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. He's trying everything he can do to give Jesus back to them without crucifying. And they say in verse 15, But they cried out, Away with him, away with him. They rejected Jesus. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Almost sarcastically, the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. We know that in the next few verses, Jesus is taken away. He is nailed to a cross, and there he dies for us. And on the cross, there is three phrases in the book of John. There's seven phrases total in the Gospels recorded that Jesus said from the cross. Three of them are here. First, you have a word of compassion there in verse 26. He looks, he sees his mother, and he commits him to John. He says, Woman, behold thy son. And saith he unto the disciple, Behold thy mother. In verse 28, you see this word of suffering. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, and here's the third word, it's a word of victory, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Father, help us this morning as we look to this word and help teach us from it. In Jesus' name, 
talking about. I want you to notice this morning, you have these three words. We're not going to study each of them. We're just going to study one. In fact, in John chapter 19, verse number 30, if you have a Bible that includes the words of Jesus in red print, you'll have three words in verse 30. It is finished. But that is in our language. That's in the English language. It is three different words. It is finished. In the Greek in which it was recorded, it is one word, to telestai. It literally means to be complete, to, bl- to bring to consummation, to absolutely finish with no expectation or need of any future events or actions to happen. It literally means it is done, it is over, it is completely fulfilled. And he says that, and it's interesting. As I mentioned, verse 28, you have this word of suffering in which he says, I thirst. And then in verse 30, this word of victory, which he says, it's over. And in between there, there's this tension and there's this suffering. It's not recorded exactly how long between these two words it went, but I want you to feel the strain for a moment this morning, Jesus crying out these words of suffering and then the words of victory. The water of life cried out, I thirst. And Jesus was not on this cross for his own sins. That's what we need to understand this morning. He wasn't there for his own sins, and he wasn't there to punish his own wrongdoing. The Bible teaches that Jesus is sinless, that he is fully man sent, but he is fully God. He is God incarnate on this earth, that he was born not of a normal human relation with a mother and a physical father, but that he was born of the Holy Spirit, that he was a miraculous birth, that he is God's son given and born to mankind. And the Bible records that he lived his life perfectly. Yes, he was tempted. He suffered. He dealt with the same bodily issues that we deal with. He dealt with emotions, and he dealt with all the physical nature of, that a human being could go through. But he did it all, unlike us, without sin, without issue, without fault, and without failure. And because of that, as the Bible teaches, that our sin results in us deserving death from God from the very beginning in Genesis That was the promise, was that the result of sin would result in death. And Romans tells us that the wages or the payment, the punishment for sin is death. And Jesus, because he had no sin, deserved no death. It's as simple as that. We think in our minds, well, because he's human being. And, And sometimes I don't think we quite understand. He did not deserve any form of death. He's perfect. He is sinless. I don't think our minds can grasp the sinless nature of Jesus this morning. I think we struggle with that. Our world is so sin-riddled and sin-absorbed, and we forget that sin deserves pain, turmoil, anxiety. It deserves worry, disgust, and torment, eventual eternal separation from the favorable presence of God, and that forever we have to live at odds with our God. That's what sin deserves. But I think it so envelops our world that for us, even a moment of less sin feels like righteousness, almost perfection if someone just has less sin. But the Bible says that any sin is deserving of God's punishment in our lives. Ryan, we were talking back and forth some about his testimony and different things. And he said, you know, I know this is a different kind of testimony. He said, I don't have one of those, I don't even remember the word that he used, but he, you know, one of those stories. And he said, one of those testimonies where somebody was saved from and, and you know, listed a few different things. I said, you know, Ryan, if you think about the New Testament, and, and I said, I struggle with this for a while too. It's almost like I felt like I had to go do more sin to make my testimony better. The Bible teaches that any sin is treason, is treachery before God. And I don't think that we understand that. But I said, think about this, Ryan. Think about the New Testament. Think about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Think about who the people that Jesus ministered to and the ones that came and chose to follow him and the miracle of changing their lives. Yes, you have Peter, who's a fisherman. You have Matthew, who's a tax collector. You have publicans. You have sinners. You have adulterers. You have liars. You have thieves on literally dying for their sins on the cross. You have the woman at the well with whom he spoke. You have rejected. You have outcast. Those that were living in their sin, pulled from darkness, and the change that Jesus brought in their life because of the contrast. We need Jesus. But you know who Jesus said some of the most difficult people to bring to the fact that they needed him to begin with? 
He says, I came, doctors come for people that are sick. They don't come for those that are well. And those that think in their mind that they're well have no need or reason to see a doctor. And he says, people don't realize that their sin is overtaken in their life and that they need me. And think about the ones that Jesus said are most difficult. The, the rich religious rulers, the people that don't have a great physical need, the people that didn't have a great spiritual need, the people that, had, I said, Ryan, the people that grew up in church, <laughs> Jesus said they're the hardest ones to convince that they need me. We are, just as much as anyone in this world that is lost, and we all are born lost, sinful creatures, our story is just as much of a miracle as anyone else. Because the fact that we could sit through hundreds of sermons, thousands of hours of teaching, and be numb to it by the time that we are teenagers and young adults. Yet God, through His Spirit, chooses to work in our cold, hard, crusty lives and moves and squeezes and makes us become alive through His Holy Spirit and repentance and belief. That is a miracle. And it is only because of this finished work of Jesus. It's not because Ryan got to 20, 21, 22 years old, and now the Word of God has had enough and it's, he's worked it off enough. No, this work was finished years ago by Jesus Christ. What, what Ryan needed for salvation was not just time. What he needed was Jesus Christ. And so as you look at this text and you see him say, it is finished to tell us that I want to think about just that word for a few minutes. And I'm just going to, you have an outline there and uh, you can just look to it just for a moment. And we'll point out a few things about it. Just this one word. This word is not the concession of a defeated man. It's not the broken surrender of a doomed man. It's not the relief of a dying man. It's the triumphant shout of the Savior. It is is finished. That's why he says, number one, that it is a victorious word. Jesus had finished. He had won. John chapter 17, verse 4, says Jesus lifts up his eyes to heaven. It says he begins to pray. He says, Father, thine hour has come. Glorify thy son that thy son may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou have sent, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Jesus praying, coming into this crucifix, saying, I, the work, the law, the deeds, all that you've asked me to do, I have done. At the age of 33, most people are saying, this is just the beginning. But here Jesus is saying, it is finished. But this is more than just the end of his physical life and journey. See, Matthew chapter 1, the angel speaking to Joseph about Mary and Jesus, he says, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He's going to save his people from their sins. So when Jesus says, it is finished, he's saying, the work that I have come to do for God and the purpose for which God has sent me has come to an end. I can save people. This was not, as Jesus hung on the cross, this is not what the apostles expected. It's not what his followers hoped for. It's not what the spectators expected thought would be the display of a conquering king, the crowd just days earlier that had sung of his glory, sang of his glory, now wanted nothing to do with him. To anyone standing by, it is finished, might have sounded like the final gasp of a dying man. But to those who know Jesus and have heard the hope of the gospel, this should be a completely different cry or word. Because it's victorious, but it's also, number two, it's God-centered. The shout, I want you to understand this this morning, this shout was not just in reference to the moment that Jesus was spending on the cross. And it's not just about his work for humanity. This was the finished work that God had planned all along. Think about just in this passage, you read the book of Matthew over and over and over. It says he did this to fulfill the scripture. He did this to fulfill the scripture. Look at John chapter 19, look at verse 28. After these things, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Verse 36, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Verse 37, and again, another scripture saith, thou shalt look on him whom they pierce. Jesus is not just looking to this moment saying the moment is finished. The, the, the death is going to be complete. My life is going to be 
over. He is looking back at the culmination of all of God's plan. And he says, everything that God has planned is going to be finished in me through this work. I want you to think about this. Jesus were to cry out, or as he said this word, to tell us that it is finished. He's not focusing the attention on himself. He's focusing it on the Lord. You get that even just from the passive voice. Jesus doesn't say, I am finished. He says, it is finished. The humble servant who willingly takes his place of humility. He says, I'm not here to glorify myself. I'm here to glorify thee. I'm here to glorify God. He places the attention on the Lord and the Lord's work. He says, I have come to do God's will. And in this, it is finished. Every Old Testament prophecy, every scripture that was projected or pushed forward, every promise that God has made is finished in the work of Christ on the cross. I want you to notice, though, number three, it's the shared word. Because he doesn't say, I am finished. He says, it is finished. He says that victoriously, the work of God is done. The plan of God is accomplished in me. But, but, but if you know and you study the rest of Scripture, we don't have time this morning to go to many different places, and we will over the next few weeks. But I want you to notice what he's doing. He says, it is finished. And he extends that then to all who will believe. He is not saying the hours on the cross are done. The actual act of the murder, the actual act of the giving of his life sacrificially, or just the day itself is done. He's saying the work that is needed for salvation is finished. And he says, and he extends this to the world, those that believe and repent, it can be finished in you as well. It's not that he's saying, yeah, I have finished my part. Now you go do yours. He doesn't say that. I have finished my part. Now you prove to me how well you can do your part. He doesn't teach that. It is finished, says it is finished, and it's finished by Christ and Christ alone, and it can be finished in you, but only through Christ alone. And this morning, I think sometimes, Ryan and I uh, talked, and going back and forth, and we talked about, you heard him mention that feeling of doubt or that feeling of being unsaved, and there's times where I rely on self. He says, I wonder if I'm sorry enough. I wonder if I repented enough, if I did the right things, if I said the right things. Let me tell you, if you're a Christian this morning and you're looking back, relying on those things, you're relying on the wrong thing. It is finished, holds no other possibilities. It's not, there's, there's no other conditions. It is finished as long as somebody that believes also does these things. It's finished as long as somebody else comes along and completes this work. It's finished as long as you say or you're sorry enough or you do the right thing. No, if you have faith and you come by grace alone, repenting and believing on the finished work of God, it can be finished in your life as well. And I want you to understand this this morning. If you are saved and you are a Christian, you're a believer in Christ, the work of Christ in salvation in your life is done. It's over. There's nothing left to accomplish. Now, your sanctification is a different story. You can grow in Christ. You can put off sin as he leads you. But understand this this morning. None of those things complete your salvation. If you have come by faith in grace through Christ in repentance of sin this morning, and you are trusting in the finished work of Christ and Christ alone, that work in your life is done. God is not holding your feet over the fire, saying, well, if you sin, I'm going to get rid of that. He's not saying if you, if you rebel and go a different way, then I'm going to reject you. One of the things that Ryan and I talked about, he said in the last few years, you know, I, maybe I haven't had this interest for God. God didn't say, it's finished unless you become disinterested in me. It's finished unless you walk away for a little while. That's the beauty of the gospel, is that the power of faith and the power of salvation persists. That's the word that Ryan was talking about the other day. We, we were sitting there. It persists. It presses through all of my faults, all of my failures, and it brings me all the way to the very end. He said, what, what, if I, what if I died in a moment of sin? My faith perseveres over that moment of sin. And not my faith, like we talk about faith sometimes, like it's my strength. Not my strength, 
But simply, faith is holding to, clinging to. The finished work of Jesus Christ overcomes my faults and my failures. So it's not that if I sin, I was never saved to begin with, or that if I fall into sin, it's proof that I've lost my salvation. That cannot happen because the work of God in your life this morning is finished in terms of salvation. Your eternity is settled. We struggle with the very base things sometimes of our lives and of our faith because we, we, we think so much of self. I wonder this morning how many of us as Christians, we think that our sin is stronger than Jesus' grace. Like, but for some reason, I've had a rough week with sin this week, so God doesn't love me like he did at the beginning of last week. That's, hard. That's a weak love. That's not the love that the Bible teaches. That for some reason I have turned and rebelled in my heart. I'm cold and I'm lukewarm toward the Lord. And so that grace of God on my life has waned. God's grace has not waned. Maybe our interest has. Maybe our energy toward it has. But his work is just as finished today as it was last week. And it will be just as finished next Sunday as it is today. The work when Jesus says, it is finished. And then he shares that work with us. I want you to think about this final. It's a, it's a saving word. Because when he says it is finished, I mentioned a moment ago, the word is to tell us thy. Servants would use this term when they completed their tasks and artists may use it when they finished their piece of art. It's done. It's over. It's finished. Nothing left. A warrior would use it when, his, when they had prevailed in battle. We might use this word if we were to still use it today. When we graduate from college, when we cross the finish line of a marathon, when we pay off our debt, the term even in that day was commercial. A form of this word would often be written on a receipt to show this payment, this invoice, this bill has been paid to tell us that it is done, it's taken care of. There's no more account even left here. In the work, get this Christian this morning, the work that God needed to do in your heart to save you from your sin. Jesus Christ's death on the cross writes on that work to tell us that it's done, it's finished. There's not even an account left to handle. That's the work that Jesus has done in us, and that should energize us, it should move us, it should break us, it should baffle us that Jesus Christ has saved us from our sins by his death on the cross. And you see there under that last point, some ways that Jesus saves. I encourage you this morning, hopefully just from the testimony of Ryan, you're going to see in a moment an example of baptism. Philip's going to sing a song called Follow Me, but the work that Jesus does in saving us, that Jesus first saves completely. I want you to think about that. He saves completely over all of your sin. God's righteousness, His holiness demands perfect righteousness that no human being could ever offer. Let me ask you this morning, what sin is keeping you, whether you're a Christian and you say it's keeping me apart from my relationship with the Lord, or maybe you're not a Christian this morning, you say sin is keeping me from having a relationship this morning. What sin is keeping you from the Lord? And then let me attach to this the answer. It does not matter. It does not matter. Because when you trust the blood of Christ, to tell us thy, it is finished, is written over all of your sins. Every one of them. The ones you committed years ago, the ones that you committed yesterday, the ones that you'll commit years from now. All of them. You say, how does that, un how does that happen? Only through the finished power of Jesus Christ and his work for you. I don't understand it. I was writing out different sins yesterday, and I realized on accident I was actually accidentally going in ABC order. We read a view for you this morning. As humans, there's adultery, bitterness, cheating, disobedience, deceit, drunkenness, foolishness, fornication, greed, gossip, hatred, hypocrisy, idolatry, immorality, lust, lying, murder, neglect, pride, quarreling, reveling, slander, stealing, a temper, unforgiveness, using God's name in vain, vanity, witchcraft, worry, and if you want to Z, you could say zeal for wrong things. But whatever the sin in your life is, if I missed yours somehow, if Jesus has saved your life, then on the account of that sin is written, paid. It is finished. It is done. It is over. 
And so now the Lord calls us to move and to move forward and move on for him. Jesus saves completely. He saves exclusively. And this is an important message for all of us this morning, but especially for some that may not be Christians. There is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. Because when he said it is finished, it means it can only come through him. You cannot do anything. It is already done. A man under conviction, I don't know if this story is true, but it's a pretty good illustration. There's a story about a man under conviction that showed up late to a gospel church meeting one night, and he sought out the preacher and said, what must I do to be saved? And the preacher says, it's too late. You can't do anything. And the man was very alarmed. He said, no, no, no. I, I, I know I'm a little late for the service. I didn't miss the service. Well, what can I do to be saved? And he said again, in melancholy tone, he says, it's too late. You can't do anything. The man urgently, no, please tell me, what can I do to be saved? And with more passion, he says, you can't do anything to be saved. It's already done. Only through Jesus Christ. This is the essence of the gospel. And that salvation is in Christ and Christ alone. And I want you to look at the last thing there. I think that you have on your notes. We say there's no work, salvation outside of the work of Christ. You know, my one Isaiah says, he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. He was smitten and stricken, despised by men. He suffered for us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The, de the, the, the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. And he says, what did we do? We like sheep have gone astray. In salvation, that, that's what it is. He does it all. We do nothing but come and claim. You say, that doesn't sound like it should work. It shouldn't. By human nature and by human explanation, that is not how things typically happen. But it is the only way. Ray Pritchard, author, wrote, if Jesus paid it all, it means that you don't have to. He says, if you try to pay for your salvation, it means... You don't think he paid at all. He says there's no middle ground between these two propositions. A Christian farmer one day was witnessing to a carpenter. He couldn't convince the carpenter of his need for Christ. The carpenter said, I live a good life. I, I even go to church. I do good things. I, I don't need this conversion that you speak about. I, I'm okay. I'm righteous before the Lord. I, I do all that I know to do. That is good. Sure, I have failed it sometimes, but I have lived a good life, and I have, I, I'm right before my God. The Christian farmer frustrated for weeks and weeks and weeks. He could not convince him any differently. And finally, the farmer one day he ordered a gate from the carpenter. And he said, I want you to build me a gate. He said, my animals keep getting out. He pointed to the broken gate. He said, I'm going to build you a good gate. We're friends. I'm going to build you the best gate that I can. It's going to be secure. It's going to be strong. So a few weeks later, the carpenter came back. He installed the gate. And a week or two later, the carpenter came back to check on him, knocked on his door, took him out and said, yeah, it's, it's holding up strong. And the farmer picked up an axe and he walked to, he said, but I noticed a problem with it. And he walked up and he walked up to the gate with the axe and he started to chop away at the carpenter. He yelled at him, stop, what, in, what are you doing? And he, the farmer didn't listen. He just continued to chop and hack at it in little bits and little pieces until finally the gate was completely destroyed and no longer even a gate anymore. And the carpenter said, that was a perfectly good gate that was finished. Why would you ever do that? You have ruined it. And the farmer smiled. He said, I'm sorry that I've ruined your gate. But I want you to understand, this is exactly what you do to the finished work of Christ when you try to add all of your stuff to it. He said, you keep saying, I don't need grace. I don't need Christ. And you've hacked away at it and you've destroyed. And you don't even have a real salvation. Because it's not what Jesus provided. Brings us to the last thing. Jesus saves eternally. May 1st, 2003, George Bush, president of the United States at that time, landed on the USS Abraham Lincoln dock near San Diego. He gave an address. And in this address, the aircraft carrier announced to the, the end of the major combat operations in Iraq. A banner was hung that said, Mission Accomplished. But we know that that was May 1st of 2003. <laughs> Guerrilla warfare and all sorts of battles and hundreds of thousands of troops established there later, thousands of troops. Most troops died. The majority of troops that died in Iraq 
died after it was declared mission accomplished. And I want you to think about in your life this morning, Jesus lacks nothing. And when he says it is finished, it's not it is finished and there's more to do for the next 20 years. It is finished and you need to complete this somehow. No, it is finished and it is done. So let's tie it together. What does this mean for Christians this morning? It means that your salvation is complete. And now you can serve the Lord with reckless abandon. One man said it this way. He says, Jesus has finished his work for me. Now I must get to work for him. Not that I persevere to earn my salvation, but because of all that he has done and because I am saved. All the types, the promises, the prophecies, every sacrifice, every ceremony, all of it is finished in Jesus Christ. No one took Jesus' life from him. His death was a voluntary surrender, a surrender which he had the authority to make because he then had the authority to take it up again and live for eternity. And so you can trust knowing that the work that Jesus has done in your life this morning and be encouraged that it is a forever work. But to those that are not Christians, and Christian this morning, to those of you that have lost loved ones, family members, to those that Jesus has finished his work, it is finished eternally. But look right here. To those in whom Jesus' work has not been finished, at this moment, the prospect is that it will eternally remain that way. Because if I die or the Lord returns, if you die in your sins without the finished work, saving work of Jesus Christ in your life. It stays that way forever. But you dwell in punishment. That you dwell apart from the favorable presence of God. And that you live when the opportunity was there to trust in the finished death, the sacrifice of Christ for you. And so I want you to think about your own friends, your own family this morning. Who is it? You can rest Breathe easy. Jesus has finished his work in you for salvation. It's done. It's settled. But there's a world around us that is unsettled. There's a, work, there's a world around us that is lost and without hope. And what is our word to them this morning? Bow your head if you would. Close your eyes. I'm going to ask Philip just to sing for us in a moment. A verse of invitation. A little different. I'm not, we're not going to ask you to stand and sing anything, but um, Ryan, you can come ahead for baptism. He's going to play and sing in just a moment when he does. And As always, we have men and ladies here that are members of our church, people from our church that would be more than happy to explain the gospel to anyone that would need to know that anytime that you're here in our service and you come for any reason, but especially salvation. You know in your heart, or maybe you're unsure in your heart, like Ryan. What does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to trust in the finished work of Christ? Now at this moment or at any point in the invitation, you can come and people will meet you here, guide you in how you can know these things and what the Bible teaches. You can speak to us after, speak to us apart, but there's no more important work than what the work that Christ can do in your heart. I want you to think as Christians this morning, Jesus has finished the work of salvation in your heart. And now what's your responsibility? And it is to follow him. Ryan's going to display that in a moment through baptism. The outward showing of what God is doing inwardly. And I want you to ask yourself the question this morning, am I being obedient to Jesus Christ? Jesus has finished the work of salvation in my life. Now what am I doing for him? Not to earn anything from him but to display my gratefulness, to display my love for what he has shared and done in me. Just ask the Lord to help us, and then uh, Philip will sing. You can listen here at this altar. You can pray, kneel at your seat if you'd like. But as he sings, I want you to hear the message of his song and the call of Christ to follow him. Lord, thank you for your word, and we thank you for your love. We pray that Jesus' work on the cross would be an encouragement to us this morning that it is finished and that we can follow. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, 
Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Follow me when cares of life would draw you from the truth. Your broken nets can hold fulfillment or give purpose to your youth. Come seek a higher calling, deeper meaning now pursue. Mended from sin, come fish for men, come and follow me. Follow me when plans you made betray my perfect will. Your fearful eyes peering in through shadow can cleanse the end that I prepared. Deny your own ambitions. Give your life to wiser hands. Gain Follow me when I lead down paths unknown to you. Righteous deeds and earnest efforts can fulfill the law's demand. Give up your self reliance, secured with stubborn pride. Yield control. joy you've never known. Follow, and you'll never be alone. Follow, come make my life your own. Come and follow me. Follow me when past mistakes would crush your will to serve when it seems that my forgiveness is the last thing you deserve. I am still your loving master. Your love is all that I require. Take your eyes off men. Trust me alone and then mention each time we're here in the baptistry waters that this is an outward display of what God is doing inside our hearts and that it is not in any way have the saving power that work is already finished but this is a display to our church and then to the world and uh, we need to encourage Ryan and continue to help him point him to Jesus to grow and allow him to do the same to us I think sometimes when somebody's younger than us or 
maybe not saved as long than us, or whatever it may be, um, that we think we're the mentors. But Ryan has helped me in the last few weeks and mentored me, though he didn't even realize it. And we want to help him. So Ryan, based on your testimony of faith in Christ, we're going to baptize you today. You're good right there. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to baptize you today. We baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we baptize, we lower him into the water, picturing Christ's death for us. And we raise him out, picturing Christ's resurrection. And now we then leave to walk in newness of life in him. So that's what we're going to display today. Ryan, you trusted Christ by uh, his grace and by faith in him alone. And you've made that profession clear. So we baptize you today, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised to walk in newness of life. Probably. And we do this because it's what the Lord commands, and we're thankful for that. Stand if you would, and let's be dismissed in prayer. And um, Phillips and Church of Piano, I'll ask you to pray, and then uh, he'll play for us as we're dismissed.